Good evening, everybody. As principal, it's my happy duty to introduce this inaugural lecture, Pretense and Personhood, Theology and the Question of Authenticity, to be delivered by Professor Judith Wolfe of the School of Divinity. I will introduce Professor Wolf properly in just a moment, after which Judith will deliver her lecture, and that will be followed by a vote of thanks from the Assistant Vice Principal and Dean of Arts, Professor Paul Hibbert, who will close the formal part of our evening. A conventional drinks reception will follow, and you are all warmly invited to join us for refreshments in Upper College Hall. There are many avenues by which one becomes an academic. Some stumble into it. Others develop a taste during undergraduate study and continue. And for others still, it is such a natural calling that it is as though no other professions exist. Judith is of this latter type, an innate and profoundly brilliant academic, certainly a leading figure of her generation of scholars and one whom we feel very grateful to call a member of our university community. We are all acquainted with the argument that internationality and interdisciplinarity bring new perspectives to long-standing subjects. Judith is, in her terms, Austrian by birth, Israeli by descent, and American by adoption. And she was trained at a range of European institutions. Judith attained a first-class Bachelor of Arts degree in Literature and Philosophy from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem in 2001, an institution with which, incidentally, St. Andrews possesses a burgeoning academic partnership. Judith relocated from Israel to Oxford that same year, where she attained three further degrees, an MPhil in English Literature in 2003, a first-class Master of Arts degree in Theology in 2005, and a DPhil in Philosophical Theology in 2010. Judith was made a research fellow at Wilson College, Oxford, during her penultimate year of doctoral study, and her first academic posting was as a postdoctoral fellow at what is now Bard College, Berlin, from 2009 to 2011. Judith returned to Oxford in 2011, where she served as a teaching fellow in theology at St. John's College, and she relocated to St. Andrews when she was appointed lecturer in theology and the arts in the School of Divinity in 2014. Judith has excelled quickly during her time here, becoming senior lecturer in 2015 and professor of philosophical theology in 2017, and that accounts for an accomplished publication record in the 12 years since she completed her doctorate. <coughs> Judith has published two monographs with a further two in gestation. Her first, Heidegger's Eschatology, Theological Horizons in Martin Heidegger's Early Thought, was published by Oxford University Press in 2013, <coughs> followed swiftly by Heidegger and Theology, published by T&T Clarke in 2014. Her next monograph, Philosophical Myths of the End, is forthcoming from Oxford University Press next year, and a fourth volume, The Theological Imagination, is in preparation for Cambridge University Press. As those titles indicate, Judith's research brings her extensive literary and theological training to bear upon scriptural and philosophical subjects, with a particularly sustained interest in art, creativity, and eschatology. These interests manifest in Judith's four co-edited publications, three of which take C.S. Lewis as their subject. C.S. Lewis and the Church, Essays in Honour of Walter Hooper, published in 2011. C.S. Lewis's Perlandra, Perlandra, Reshaping the Image of the Cosmos in 2013. And C.S. Lewis and His Circle, Essays and Memoirs from the Oxford C.S. Lewis Society, published in 2015. That latter publication in particular reflects Judith's engagement with the C.S. Lewis Society, including tenure as its president from 2008 to 2009. And each of these publications was co-edited with her husband, Dr. Brendan Wolfe. Judith has more recently co-edited the Oxford Handbook of 19th Century Christian Thought, published in 2017, 
and two further collections are forthcoming, the solo-edited Cambridge Companion to Christian Eschatology, due next year from Cambridge University Press, and the three-volume Oxford History of German Theology, for which she is the co-general editor, due from Oxford University Press in 2023 and 2024. Judith's record of articles and book chapters reflects these specialisms, and she has written eclectically on subjects ranging from Lewis and Derrida to Tolkien and Kafka. Outstanding as this record is, it fails to convey Judith's special aptitude for knowledge transmission, evidenced by her complementary academic activities. Foremost amongst these is her leadership as a senior editor of the St. Andrew's Encyclopedia of Theology, a landmark development which, in line with the example set by the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, will provide an online and authoritative point of reference on theological topics for academicians, students, and general users alike. It is a project of significance and with global relevance, generously supported by a grant of £3.4 million from the John Templeton Foundation. This is part of Judith's consolidated track record of grant capture, including a recent £2 million grant from the Templeton Religious Trust for her Widening Horizons in Philosophical Theology project. Alongside the encyclopedia, Judith is an experienced public speaker in academic and public-facing environments, including on television, radio, and online streaming sources, and she regularly appears in non-academic print. Judith's services to our university are many. She is a popular teacher of note with a demonstrable record of excellence, an experienced representative of our institution in external academic activities, and a respected scholar and professional leader within her faculty. Many of you will, I hope, recognize and echo these descriptions of Judith's vision and ambition, her nuanced grasp of complex ideas, the unfailing quality of her work, and the example that she serves both to her students and her colleagues. We are fortunate to feel the benefit of her expertise at St. Andrews, and it is a pleasure now to welcome Professor Judith Wolfe to deliver her inaugural lecture, Pretense and Personhood, Theology and the Question of Authenticity. Please welcome Professor Wolfe. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Principal, for these very generous remarks, and a special thank you to my husband, Brendan Wolfe, for letting me be part uh, of the St. Andrew's Encyclopedia Project, which really is a very exciting, a very exciting future development. Professorships tie academic generations and institutions together. I'm grateful to be here with some who were my teachers and are now my colleagues, with some who were my students and are now colleagues, with many who are colleagues as well as friends, and with many who are students now, and whom it is our privilege as professors to help to discover what they will be. Esteemed principal, honored dean, master, and, uh, and principal's office, cherished colleagues, permit me to address myself primarily to those students today, because professorships exist not primarily for the sake of the professors themselves, but a scaffolding for the lives of students, frameworks that give them temporary structures against which to lean as they build their lives. It is exactly this question of building a life that I want to address in this lecture, specifically the relationship between what we call authenticity and the playing of roles in shaping a good life. A professorship is a role that exists to create space Space in the sense of a sphere of action for the professor, of course, but also and as importantly space in the sense in which I have just mentioned, a clearing or scaffold that allows students to grow. This function of a role as a means of creating a space of growth and discovery is often lost in our general suspicion of social roles as inimical to personal expression and discovery. It is worth recovering. The question that animates this exploration of roles is the one that we all always already face. What kind of world do we live in? 
and how do we live well within it? This is an ethical question in the general sense in which the term ethos denotes dwelling, custom, and character. It is also an ethical question in the more familiar sense that dwelling, custom, and character are shaped by what we might call moral values. This is not a normative claim, but an axiomatic one. I mean that in order to act with deliberation and passion, we humans require values, objects or principles that we respect, towards which we can orient ourselves. Just as it is only within a structuring system such as Euclidean space that we can locate and measure points and lines, so it is only within or against the background of moral frameworks in this sense that we can define and evaluate different courses of action and therefore that we can move. In other words, unless we're responding unreflectively to pressing demands or strong stimuli, we are always orienting ourselves within a moral space organized by what we perceive as good, that is what is to be pursued, or as bad, that is what is to be avoided. Such orientation requires both a kind of knowledge, we must recognize the good, and a kind of desire, we must want it. The traditional account, shared by Plato, Aristotle, the Stoics, and much of Christian history, was that this moral space is objective and absolute, and that it is our duty to inhabit it well. This duty, within the old traditional account, is not an imposition, but a form of self-realization. For Plato, as for Augustine and Aquinas, the world was an ordered whole with a gradation of value, and the human person is most integrated, most realized, if you will, when she orders herself in accordance with such value, recognizing what is true and desiring what is good. For centuries, this order provided a profound sense of orientation within the world. Nietzsche bemoaned precisely this loss of moral space and orientation when he had his madman declare, God is dead and we have killed him. What were we doing when we unchained this earth from its sun? Whither is it moving now? Whither are we moving? Away from all suns? Are we not plunging continually, backwards, sidewards, forwards, in all directions? Is there still any up or down? There are ways in which this vision of an absolute moral order remains relevant. And if you want to pursue that question, St. Mary's module in philosophical theology is a good place to start. <laughs> However, both rightly and wrongly, it is now difficult to uphold it in its traditional form. A long history of social hierarchies that have methodically excluded some people from agency, abuses justified by authority, and by an ever-increasing awareness of the difficulty of achieving advantages for one group without disadvantages for another, have contributed to an evacuation of the ideal of an absolute moral order. Rather, People have increasingly come to suspect that any claims to objective truth or value and any demands made on others in their name are a masked pay, play for power and dominion. Behind this assumption is the increasing suspicion that the world is not an ordered whole at all, but a vast field of competing and ultimately irreconcilable wills. This suspicion is both justified and insufficient but again, for a fuller discussion, you must uh, come to a different forum. This is this enchantment has not, however, eradicated the deep need to know and desire something of value, some point of orientation, to be able to act with deliberation and passion. The great philosophical systems of the 20th century, at least in Europe, all wrestle with this need. And the quintessential modern answer, given in different forms by Kierkegaard, Heidegger, and others, is the ideal of authenticity. To understand this is also to begin to define the problem of roles that I'm addressing in this lecture. The older ideal of a fixed moral order was often seen to be acted out through socially defined, equally fixed roles. To be a good citizen or a good Christian was to step into social roles that prescribed frameworks of behavior and excellence for individuals. Laird, Clark, paterfamilias, servant. Those who were subordinate within the overarching order also had to accept subordinate roles. Amid the suspicions of Western modernity, 
social rules were therefore increasingly seen as instruments of oppression, inflexible molds pressed down on inner lives in stifling and unfairly stratifying ways. Kierkegaard associates this kind of role play with an inauthentic Christendom as over and against Christianity. Heidegger associates it with Das Mann, the oppressive tyranny of the impersonal they. Many modern philosophers, psychologists, and novelists set against this oppressive regime of roles a contrasting ideal of being radically true to oneself, what we call the ideal of authenticity. Both Kierkegaard and Heidegger recognized this ideal as problematic, but it has taken a powerful hold of the modern imagination. In its common form, the ideal of authenticity rests on one simple but ultimately elusive idea, that there is in each of us an innermost self, a core of identity apart from all roles and social mores, which we can discover and try to realize. This suggestion is profoundly alluring because it seems to resolve with one brilliant idea, the problem, the crisis of the destruction of an objective moral order, the need for orientation within moral space. The ideal of authenticity suggests a source of orientation at the heart of our very selves, to which we have privileged epistemic access, no one else can know what is deep inside me but I can, and whose realization is profoundly desirable because it promises no less than the possession of our own unique selves. It also seems to avoid the endless jostling of competing wills because, at least in theory, the ideal makes no claims for or on others. However, the more we have pursued this ideal over the last 200 years, the more we have come to realize that the ideal of human authenticity, while deeply attractive, always threatens to erode itself from within. For a long time now, we have come to suspect, as expressed forcefully by Richard Dawkins, Daniel Dennett, and others, that what we regard as our own personal desires and goals are in fact genetically coded mechanisms for the perpetuation of our genetic material, mechanisms for survival and propagation, which have little to do with will or personality, with particularity and integrity as we experience them. And especially since the aggregation of big data, we have become increasingly aware of the ways in which these desires and instincts which guide people in choosing their purposes can be conditioned and manipulated by algorithms. In other words, the Western dream of humans as self-determined, free to create and choose the purposes that they pursue seems more and more like an illusion which is thrown up by our own subpersonal instincts and desires, which can in turn be manipulated by those who crack their codes and learn to trigger our desires, our fears and disgusts as well. Much of our economy is intended to serve the wishes of the consumer seeking to realize him or herself, but these wishes are themselves constantly manipulated by the system which is meant to serve them. Similarly, our political systems are in large part meant to ensure the flourishing of those whom they protect, and yet they manipulate feelings of fear, resentment, and rivalry to dictate what counts as flourishing. One of the dilemmas of this situation is a painful sense of contradiction between our experience of ourselves and how we seem, in fact, to work. We are constantly facing the fear that the way we experience the world, what we regard as our own wishes, desires, and purposes, is fundamentally illusory, that behind it all are subpersonal and superpersonal forces that manipulate us like puppets on strings. On the one hand, this painful sense of contradiction between our experience of life and what may lie behind it feels inescapable. On the other hand, it is unlivable, precisely because it takes away from us the sense of moral space within which we could orient ourselves. The acute and overwhelming mental health crisis in the Western world, despite unprecedented prosperity, is in part the result of technology not merely outpacing our capacity to assimilate it, but revealing life as fundamentally at odds with itself. This contemporary situation sharpens a dilemma that has been at the heart of European philosophy for the last hundred or more years. The work of Kierkegaard and of Heidegger is full of critique of social roles, animated by the search for a livable ideal of authenticity, 
For Kierkegaard, this search goes as far as the renunciation of his engagement, uh, social world par excellence, though it is also played out through the incessant role play of his many pseudonyms. For Heidegger, authenticity exists ultimately only in the realization that it is impossible. For Levinas and for Mario, authenticity is fueled by the radical demands of the other or by the inbreaking of phenomena that overwhelm our role play. And for others still, including Derrida, role playing or some other form of conventional signification always overrides authenticity. Critical theorists are engaged in a deep conflict whether we are defined by our demographic roles, whether blackness, womanhood, or other social group markers precede us, or whether all roles are utterly fluid and can be changed at will. In short, we find ourselves in a world in which we find it increasingly difficult to believe in any absolute moral order in which, to which we might simply conform, but in which we are also increasingly despairing of an authentic self that might guide our orientation. Art can lead philosophy through doors that philosophy might not be able to open itself. We who are torn between the need for orienting moral frameworks and the threat of alienation from ourselves and others may find unlikely respite in a place that is only ever ephemeral and temporary, the theater. The theater is a forum where role playing neither oppresses nor trivializes, but rather creates space for discovery. Whereas Kierkegaard, Heidegger, and others denounced the deadening hand of social roles, we now need to rediscover a different side of such roles, precisely as complex means of moral discovery in a shifting space. And the theater can help us. For those of us who love the theater, one of its strongest allures is the paradoxical freedom of role playing. I know that when I was trying to figure out who I was as a youth, I consistently found that myself, my desires, convictions, and hopes was so fluid that if I reached inside myself, there was nothing to take hold of, only a mass of contradictory and often ill-founded desires, impressions, and self-images. And I found at that time, growing up as I did in the theater world, that playing theater roles was the only way in which I could inhabit my own life, in which I could channel my liquid and undirected emotions and impulses. Social roles can be like theater roles in this respect. Amid the profound anxiety of our age, it can seem impossible to take hold of one overarching good by which we might orient our lives, but we can understand ourselves and each other under particular descriptions. Daughter and sister, pupil and friend, student, that most glorious of life roles, worker, parent, Many of these roles are rooted in physical realities, but they are also associated with characteristic goods and virtues. In this second sense, social roles are behavioral patterns that have developed over long periods of trial and error to enable and maximize certain aims or goods. What is passed on with a role is a whole complex of implicit knowledge codified in patterns of behavior whose purpose we may not fully understand about social goods and how to realize them. Roles therefore pass on possibilities of comportment and movement within the world. They give us spaces for action. Within them, we can achieve excellence and meaning. Our roles, though we often assume them deliberately, in an important sense also precede us. They are in some sense bigger than we and can become molds into which we can pour our liquid selves. In role-playing of this sort, the anxiety of authenticity falls temporarily away. Sincerity follows rather than motivates our choice. In that sense, it is more important to choose the right roles than to strive for authenticity. As Kurt Vonnegut said, we are what we pretend to be so we must be careful about what we pretend to be. At the same time, social roles represent risks and temptations. Roles are neither immutable nor safe. This is partly because roles, like most things, are shaped statistically. They are optimized for what works best in the aggregate, 
and individual situations might call for different responses. Roles can also be means of codifying and justifying exploitative behavior. And some roles develop their own dynamics and run away from any consciously chosen purposes. Take, for example, the social media influencer, a role arising in part from the artificial reward mechanisms of social media, which creates patterns of behavior whose consequences we do not yet understand. Hence, the notion of a virtuoso, again more familiar from the arts, is relevant also to social roles. A virtuoso is capable of mastering or internalizing a role, but also of improvising, extending its range of possibilities without distorting its purposes. As is implicit in what I have just said, roles do not in fact escape the question of overarching good. They merely distribute the burden of its identification across roles in society, dispersing decision-making from the conscious deliberation, from conscious deliberation to a host of often invisible factors. Because they are ways in which societies find, negotiate, and pursue their goods, they require active inhabitation and shaping rather than merely passive following. What I have said so far makes it sound as if roles are optional, as if we could step in and out of social roles as we can of theater roles. But part of my point is precisely that this is not the case. Our life with roles is so poignant because on the one hand, we always understand ourselves under some description and do not possess a dressing room away from it all where we are simply ourselves. And on the other, roles are brittle and unreliable. On the one hand, roles are in some significant sense bigger than we. They are load-bearing structures on which we can lean and within which we can orient ourselves, seeking meaning and excellence. But on the other hand, roles are always at best penultimate. Within society, they are fluid, giving shape to inchoate senses of overarching meaning and value. Within lives, they display gaps, inconsistencies, tensions, which we can't use the roles themselves to navigate. Roles, in other words, do not solve the problem of selfhood for us. However, they locate it. Shakespeare's theater is so deeply moving, partly because it harnesses the power of theatrical roles to explore the power and perplexities of the roles that we play in life. Contrary to what the ideal of authenticity declares, the question of selfhood arises when it does, most often not as the unmoored question, who am I, but from the gaps and tensions in our role playing. It arises when we seem too liquid to cast ourselves into a role at all, as Prince Hal does in Henry IV, when a social role that we have assumed is fundamentally at odds with our urgent desires, as for Anthony and Anthony and Cleopatra, when the demands of our social roles seem fundamentally ambiguous or indeterminate, as for the title character of Hamlet, when the demands of two social roles clash as they do for Hermione in The Winter's Tale, or when their internal reward structures go against their wider social aim, as for the title character of Macbeth. Perhaps the most urgent and personal moments of our lives arise in the gaps and tensions between the roles we assume in society. Shakespeare's most arresting emblem of this, of course, is King Lear, standing on a heath in the storm that blows from just those gaps, recognizing both himself and Edgar, another inveterate role player, for one brief moment as the same poor, bare, forked animal. And yet Lear, like Shakespeare's other great characters, cannot simply stop acting. He, Hamlet, Macbeth, and Leontes all know the pathetic insufficiency of roles, but they also recognize that there is not simply a space beyond roles into which they might confidently step. Life is but a poor walking shadow, a poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. There is no cure for that, as Samuel Beckett said. When in Shakespeare's or in Beckett's work, characters do try to step away into such a space, shedding their roles, when perhaps they might reach a point of authenticity beyond role playing, why, then the play is at an end. As fundamental as social roles may be to us, the crises of these Shakespearean tragedies 
extend beyond crises of social roles to what we might call crises of narrative roles. By narrative role, I mean that beneath and encompassing our social roles, we tend to cast ourselves in one unchangeable, actually a changeable but persistent role, namely that of the protagonist of the story of our lives. To say this might sound like an unnecessarily figurative way of saying that we are always the subject of our own consciousness, but the term role draws attention to the fact that in relation to ourselves, we do not inhabit only the first person perspective of an actor, but also the third person perspective of ourselves as the protagonist of a story that we are telling or a play that we are enacting. We both are ourselves and see ourselves. As we have already said, meaningful movement is only possible within a moral coordinate system. And this system is for us each profoundly shaped by the story that we see ourselves as inhabiting. Severe trauma is so debilitating, partly because it makes it impossible to tell a coherent story about our lives anymore. This kind of role playing, which can constitutes a more active form of meaning making than the assumption of social roles, is also more morally complex, partly because it is both more immediate and less shareable. Each of us plays social roles side by side with others assuming the same roles. I am a teacher alongside other teachers, finding community and solidarity in our joint role. By contrast, none of us can assume a narrative role in her own life that she can fully share with others. We are always the protagonists of our own lives and cast others in roles vis-a-vis -vis ourselves with which they almost by definition cannot fully identify, supporting roles or antagonistic ones. Of course we acknowledge, at least in theory, that others too are protagonists to themselves but it is something that we need to continually remind ourselves of. <clears throat> Unlike social roles, which can be jointly defined, our narrative roles are often incommensurate with each other because everyone is protagonist to him or herself and something else to others. And what role we play in another's consciousness is something that's very little under our own control. This dynamic can lead to profound loneliness and disorientation this has become especially evident, I would say, in the pandemic and its aftermath, when we have so often been reduced to squares on one another's screens, to be pinned, shifted, minimized, muted, and turned off at will. To some extent, we have made real the vision of Descartes' meditations, or a darkened theater, becoming to each other not real persons in a shared space whose relative movements affect one another, but apparitions slotted into plays or stories that are increasingly of each one's single imagining. Similarly to online meetings, social media can be powerful connectors enabling us to inhabit a shared space, even when we are physically distant, but often they warp moral space. It is so tempting to turn ourselves into characters, to turn moments into displayed memories before we have even experienced them. Doing so, we widen the gap between our heightened self-view as protagonist and the way that we appear to others as exemplar, competitor, or troll for that matter. A dynamic sharpened, of course, by social media algorithms that optimize for emotional response. The more we insist on the role of protagonist and cast others into supporting or antagonistic roles, the more we maneuver ourselves into competition, or worse, find ourselves the only players among non-player characters in a cosmos without coordinates. If the question of selfhood arises in relation to social roles, in the gaps or tensions between the roles that we inhabit, then that question arises in relation to narrative roles, in the gaps or tensions between the role that I assume in my own life and the roles in which I am cast in the lives of others. Like social roles, narrative roles locate the question how the self is constituted. To what extent, for example, the role I play in my own life is truer or more defining of myself than the roles that I play in the lives of others. Who has the authority to tell the story of a life? This is, among others, 
a theological question. Religion is often associated with roles in both senses, both social and narrative roles. And it is true that religious faith and communities are a powerful source of roles with all their potential and their risks. Religious communities supply clearly defined social roles, which can be great goods if they offer frameworks by which to shape useful and meaningful lives, though it is also important to recognize that they can sometimes be lifeless or distorting. More importantly, perhaps, the Christian faith offers a very powerful narrative role. Within its cosmic story of creation, fall, salvation, and sanctification, we are able to take our place as part of a larger narrative in which we do not have to be perfect protagonists, but can admit to failure and need for help. This allows us to step into a wider world. At the same time, it is important to recognize that though the Christian story is larger than we, we locate ourselves within it narratively and can get entangled in our own telling. Talk to anyone who has had a major crisis of faith and who looks back with puzzlement and disappointment on the way that she has been telling her own spiritual story. Yes, role-taking in both its social and narrative forms is essential to religious faith and can help to shape lives that display virtue and meaning. But even more than about roles, faith and theology are about their gaps. The times when our social roles break apart, either by being flooded or by being hollowed out. And the times when our narrative roles, our sense of our lives as a coherent story in which we play an integrative role, fail whether because we realize that in cultivating our own stories, we have made other people unreal to ourselves and hurt them, or because our story appears to be coming to an abrupt end in the face of crisis or death. Psychology and philosophy have crucial things to say about such breaking points, including in therapeutic contexts. But theology says something quite different in kind to both of these. I have said earlier that many of us have experienced the paradoxical freedom of role-playing in the theater. I found it so in my youth. And yet, one of my profound challenges then was to reconcile my need for roles with the presence, the simple presence of other people whom I could not fit into any of my roles, but who nevertheless demanded acknowledgement. Social roles can enable constructive and meaningful exchange between people, but they are merely channels and not the exchange itself. Consider the roles of teacher and student. Being a teacher creates a space in which I can offer constructive criticism to students in a way that would be strange for me to do with a mere acquaintance. An academic seminar creates space in which we can thrash out complex questions together without much other contextualization or small talk. These scripts offer spaces of encounter, but we need to fill them. And to do so requires us not merely to follow a script. It requires openness and vulnerability to concrete others. Roles can create spaces in which openness of this kind is possible, but only if we let them be porous to others rather than defenses against them. This may sound as if there is, after all, a self beside roles, but I am suggesting not that we can step out of our roles into a mere or more authentic self known to us, but that our roles create spaces in which we can recognize others as, ex as exceeding mere roles, and that our recognition can help them to know themselves better. There's a profound sense in which the narrative roles in which we cast ourselves may be less true or capacious than the possibilities created and the recognition enabled by our role playing with others. There are times and ways in which, as Stanley Cavell has insisted, others can know us better than we know ourselves. This is a profoundly risky suggestion. 
it takes out of our hands any final control over the meaning of our lives and selves, because how we play into others' lives and how they see us may be equally important as our own sense of self. More controversially, it places into the hands of others some measure of power over that sense of self, and it can cause great damage if someone's self is reflected back to her or him through a twisted role. <clears throat> and yet this sense that our roles are not defenses but open spaces, and that ourselves are to some extent given to us in our encounters with others in and beyond those spaces, is grounded in a deep theological conviction which does not depend on the capacities of mere humans. This conviction is that the deepest wellspring of who we are and how we are to orient ourselves in the world is found neither in fixed and impersonal values nor in the bastion of our inner selves, but in the calling and love of God. The psalmist rushes to praise God for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. He recognizes that God's thoughts about us are precious and more numerous than the sand. When I awake, he adds, I am still with thee. St. Paul suggests that it is not in introspection, but in allowing ourselves to be seen by God that we both are and know ourselves. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. For the New Testament writers, and in a more limited sense for Heidegger, this fullness of understanding is not achievable with an earthly life, where all our actions are incomplete and God remains partly hidden. It is an eschatological promise. And so fundamentally, Christianity believes that we need roles because we are not yet ourselves. They are, as I said earlier about professorships, after all, temporary scaffolds or channels, enabling us to receive the call and the love of God and of others. We move through the world as T.S. Eliot put it, with the drawing of this love and the voice of this calling. And as long as they draw us, we shall not cease from exploration. Thank you. Well, it's my very great pleasure to be able to offer the vote of thanks to Professor Wolf, um, and I will confine my remarks to this side of the Eschaton and not stray into territory, which is beyond my uh, capacity. I'd like to say that I've framed my remarks in two ways. The first way is physically, by being scripted as the Dean of Arts and appearing in front of you physically as the Dean of Divinity, just to add some confusion to the discussion of roles. Now to the, my main remarks about an enlightening, stimulating, and appropriately challenging lecture for the times in which we live. Professor Wolf has highlighted that the challenges of knowing who we are, who we might become, and how to virtuously and meaningfully inhabit our roles in society are all rooted, for me at least, in hermeneutics, that is, in questions of interpretation. Her lecture reminds us, as Bourdieu puts it, that we know that we are caught up in and comprehended in the world that we take as our object. In response, we are inev inevitably drawn, following Gadamer, to take up the larger narrative, the traditions into which we are born, and try to inhabit them in more reflexive and critical ways, just as Professor Wolf has done. However, following Van der Velde, if our roles in society have been shaped over time by the lengthy reinterpretation of tradition, and anchored in a vertical axis of meaning by that, they are also caught up in the maelstrom of ideas, influence and invention on the contemporary horizontal axis of meaning, just as Professor Wolf has shown us. As such, our choices are constrained before we begin, and we can never fully unpick the basis of our understanding or feel that we are certain of the epistemological ground on which we stand. And so, as that lesser-known philosopher Jim Morrison puts it, into this house we're born, into this world we're thrown. 
we are unmoored, as Professor Wolf puts it. That can perhaps leave us feeling that the conclusions of another less known philosopher who talked about our potential for moral movement, perhaps Jeff Beck, summed up our condition pretty well. You're everywhere and nowhere, baby. That's where you're at. <laughs> so how do we inhabit our roles in our society in ways that can be recognized as good when feeling disoriented and without a secure place to stand and uncertain about what ground we could even claim as our own? Professor Wolf has shown us how. By wrestling with interpretations of our traditions, being honest about the challenges that come with turbulent intellectual and non-intellectual debates, and living authentically with intractable questions. Both Professor Wolf's terrific lecture and her example of a truly honest and authentic scholarly journey help us to keep struggling forward. Professor Wolf, thank you. Thank <laughs> you.